to our Bible story today in the first week of this series that I'm calling Jesus Face to Face. All right, this is going to be Luke chapter 18, verse 35. Okay, Luke chapter 18, verse 35. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read the whole story. Because the scenario that I just asked you to imagine yourself in is the exact same scenario that we find a man in in this story. And I'm going to read the whole thing, then we'll, then we'll break it down. This is Luke chapter 18, verse 35. I love it. Give me a moment to turn those Bible pages. I love that sound. It's such a great sound. Or to get there on your phone, that's fine. Phones are also acceptable. Hard copies are better, but <laughs> phones are acceptable. This is, this is uh, Luke chapter 18, verse 35. You with me? Here we go. As Jesus approached Jericho. Okay, pause for a minute. Okay. A little background. Jesus is traveling. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. This is where he's actually in the book of Luke. Uh, he has been on his way to Jerusalem really since the beginning. As his ministry got up and going, everything has been pointing here. Because what's going to happen in Jerusalem? In Jerusalem, he is going to die. Right? This is where he is headed. So we are in kind of the last stages of his journey. He is heading to Jerusalem because in Jerusalem, a bunch of things are going to happen in quick succession. He's going to enter into Jerusalem on a donkey. And you remember, this is Palm Sunday. He's going to enter Jerusalem on a donkey. And then after that, not long after that, right? he's going to be betrayed. He's going to be arrested. And then he's going to be crucified. So we are really right into it here. He is on his way to doing this. And if you were Jesus, I think if, if any one of us were Jesus, we would have a lot on our mind at this point. right? This is what he is doing and it says, as he approached Jericho, Jericho is on the road to Jerusalem. So let's continue reading. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside, begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and ordered the man be brought to him. And when he came near, Jesus asked him, What? Do you want me to do for you? <coughs> Lord, I want to see, he replied, obviously. <clears throat> okay, the obviously is not in there. That's just in the Pastor Steve International Version of the Bible. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. Okay, this is the word of the Lord. From Luke 18, 35 to 43. Now, here's the series that we're in. Jesus face to face. And this is what I believe out of these stories. When people meet Jesus, when they really meet him, oh, I'm just everyone is going to get out of And when they and really meet him, die. really meet Jesus and begin a relationship with him, everything changes. And so these four stories we're going to look at as we lead up to Easter are four points in Jesus' ministry where he meets somebody face-to-face, -face, and after that one face-to-face -face encounter, their lives are never the same. And that is absolutely the case with our blind man. Uh, this, is, this story is told in a couple of different Gospels, as well as not just Luke. It's also told in Matthew and Mark. And, uh, and in Mark, uh, we are given a name, and his name is Bartimaeus. Okay. So he's come to be known as Blind Bartimaeus. Right? So that you may hear me say that name, and you're like, where is that in Luke? It's not in Luke, it's in Mark. Okay? But I might pull the name over from time to time just to avoid continuing to call him the man or the blind man. All right? So 
In this encounter, in this face-to-face -face encounter, we're going to learn some important things about Jesus Christ. Uh, is that all right if I talk about Jesus for a little while? Is that good? Okay. Let's look at your notes. Number one, Jesus sees us. Go let that kind of run into that was on that was on purpose. Jesus sees us. For many of you, you came to church today, and this is the thing that you needed to hear. For many, many of you facing many different things. I know about some of them. I know that we've got people in the room today who have spouses that are in the hospital. I know that we've got people in the room today who are awaiting medical reports. I know that we've got people in the room today who have unsaved kids. I know that we've got people in the room today who have estranged relationships with siblings and it breaks their hearts. I, I know that this is what we have. That's just the ones I know about. And I know that there's plenty more stories in this room of people going through particularly difficult things. And, and I'm telling you, for many of you today, you came to church and this is the thing that you needed to hear. Jesus sees you. He sees you. You might get disappointed. You might get disappointed by other people in life who dismiss you. That might happen. And, and, and for sure, you're going to go through life, and there's going to be many times where you're going through something, and nobody else around you understands remotely what has happened. They have no appreciation, really, for how difficult your circumstance is. And there's going to be many times in life. Even though we've got friends, even though we've got the church where we feel a bit alone. And here is the message that I want to give to you, at least right here at the outset. Jesus sees you. He sees what's going on. Look at the text in verse 35. As Jesus approached Jericho, right, he's even on his way to doing something, right? How many of us are good at noticing other people when we're on our way to doing something? I'm not great at it, okay? Okay. I'm not really great at it. Somebody said to me in the lobby, he said, man, you look like a man on a mission. It's like, yeah, when I'm in the lobby, I'm on a mission to greet as many people as I possibly can because so often I'm running into people. You ever run into a church person at the grocery store? <laughs> They're like, man, I love you in the name of Jesus, but I am on my way to the mustard right now. <laughs> and if I don't continue this mission, I will forget it, right? This is something I've read this, but Jesus on his way, uh, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging, let's understand the situation for him. If you are Bartimaeus, what has happened to you? And we don't know if he's blind from birth or not. It's, it's possible that he was, but certainly blind long enough that it has dramatically affected his life. If you are disabled in this way at this time, you have no options. There is one road available to you, one path of life that you can take, and that is to become a beggar. That's the only hope that you have. You have no other hope. And, by the way, at this time especially, as kind of is true in all times, uh, beggars uh, not lifted high by society. So even as you can see right here, look at in verse 39, it says, those who led the way rebuked him, right? So just remember, this is the crew that's part of the Jesus entourage. They're the ones that are traveling with Jesus, and they're at the front of the crowd, and they, their response to this blind man is to say, actually in the Greek, it's shut your mouth. It's strong. It is strong. Even when everybody else is dismissing you, you have been dismissed by society, you have been dismissed by life. Look at the one person who stops everything and stops everything that he's doing to see this one man. It's Jesus Christ. Of course it's Jesus. Of course this is what Jesus would do. You need a man the desperate situation that this guy's in, and he yells out. And to be fair to the people at the front of the crowd who were telling him to shut his mouth, it was probably a little embarrassing and distracting. Probably. Because with respect to my sound people here, I'm just going to, you know, he sees Jees Jesus passing by, and he asks, who is this guy? And he doesn't see Jesus, sorry. 
That's what, that's what, wow, this thing. Rewind. He doesn't see him, but he hears the commotion and the, the ask what's going on to say Jesus is passing by. His first response, you imagine, you have been, if you're this guy, you have been without hope for a long time, and now, but you've heard stories. You've heard stories about this guy named Jesus from Nazareth, and he's been going around healing people, and they said, Jesus is passing by, and he does, I think, the only sensible thing to do. Jesus! Jesus! Yeah, I think the people might be like, shh, what are you doing? Don't you understand that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem? And they said, no, Jesus stops everything. Why? Because Jesus sees us. He sees us. He's paying attention. He knows. And he wants to hear from us. That's just the first thing I wanted to say from this story. And you may need to hear that today. And I pray that it's encouraging to you that you have a Savior who's paying attention to every detail of your life. And even if everybody else is dismissing you for some reason, you have a Savior who never will. All right, this is who he is. Look at number two. Jesus also clearly sees our real need. Jesus sees our real need. Jesus meets blind Bartimaeus and asks him a question. And I'm always, I don't know about you, but I'm always fascinated when Jesus asks people questions because I'm like, don't you know? <laughs> who, who, who is Jesus? Is Jesus the Son of God? Yeah? Other, other stories, we're going to cover another one here in a couple weeks. Other stories, uh, he's hanging out uh, at, with a Pharisee at his house. And it says, I love it, it says in the text, it says, Jesus answered him, even though the only thing the guy did was have a thought. <laughs> he has a thought, and it's like, Jesus answered him. That's terrifying, by the way. If I'm hanging out with Jesus, I'm just like, no, I have a thought. He's like, actually, Steve. <laughs> I, I didn't say anything. No, I just had a thought. Jesus knows, right? So fascinating to me when he asks a question. Why? Well, he's doing it for a reason, right? He meets blind Bartimaeus, and he asks him this question. What do you want me to do for you? And I find that so fascinating. Why in the world would Jesus ask him that question? Isn't it obvious? Isn't it clear? Jesus, I don't think it's any mystery who this person is, or at least... The situation that they're in, even for the rest of the crowd that's hanging out with Jesus, who's, by the way, clueless, really, as to who he is, but still, they're hanging out with him, and they pass by this blind beggar, and I think it's obvious, anybody who's looked at it, if, if we just said, okay, here is blind Bartimaeus, and we asked everybody in the room today, what's the number one thing he's going to say if Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? What's he going to say? Yeah, I want my sight. So why are we asking the question, Jesus? I love Jesus. He's so brilliant. We can assume that Jesus is framing what he's about to do. He's putting a frame on what he is about to do in this man's life. Because Jesus clearly sees our real need. He's asking this guy for an answer to this question. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something. It's not going to sound quite right, but there's a reason why I'm saying it. Um, Jesus asks him this question, and he gets it wrong. <laughs> I think he gets it wrong, actually. Like what? Because essentially, boil the question down to what it really is. Right? What it really is, is he's saying, hey, what's the number one problem you've got? Like, number one issue that you can't solve, that I can solve for you, what's that number one thing? And the blind man says, I, I need my sight. And anybody would think, well, yeah, that's the right answer to the question, but not when you take into account who Jesus is. And not when you take into account what Jesus is there to do. It would be like you and I, if you imagine that we had a $150,000 debt that was due. You just imagine that. We have a $150,000 debt that was due and we can't pay it. And then we walk around and meet Bill Gates. Go here with me. 
Okay, I know, it's strange. Go here with me. You walk around, you meet Bill Gates. And Bill says, for some reason, for the purpose of Pastor Steve's illustration, he says, I will do any one thing for you with my vast resources. I don't know how much the guy's worth. Something like $80 billion. I can't remember. And, and he said, I will do one thing for you. Using my vast resources, I'll do anything for you, but it's one thing, what you want it to be. And it would be like me pulling out my phone and going, well, Bill, my screen is cracked. I'd love a new iPhone. <laughs> and everybody around who knows my situation would be going, what are you doing? You've got this chance. You, you are asking for this thing. You've got this chance. And you are asking for it. This iPhone, when he's willing to do this other thing, and it's because, here's why, okay? Here's why, here's number one in your notes. We are often wrong about what we need the most. You see? We are often wrong about what we need the most. This is why I asked you to entertain the question at the beginning of the sermon. I said, hey, if Jesus walked by you and said to you, asked you the same question he's asking blind Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? And I think many of us would say, could you heal my cancer? I think many of us would say, my wife is in the hospital, could you heal her and get her out? I think many of us would say, Lord, you have no idea, I mean, you do have an idea, how, how tight the finances are, could you, could you help me in that area? Because man, it's been really difficult the last few months. I think many of us would answer the question like that. And, and here's the thing. I get it. I get it. I ask myself this question, and I force myself to entertain it. There's a number of things right now. I'm sure many of us are parents would say uh, that, that the current moment, hey, well, I've got sick kids. Could you, could you heal my kids? Because this is, this is exhausting. Like, that, this is what happens in life. But the problem is that we become clouded by our felt needs. You see, there's a difference between a felt need and a real need. A felt need is something that I perceive as a need when really I don't actually need it, technically speaking. Right? So, a felt need is a perceived requirement or desire that a person may feel is necessary or important, but may not be essential for survival or well-being. But a real need is an actual requirement or necessity that a person or group of people must have to survive. And here's the truth. If you factor in the spiritual realities, if you factor in all of those things, we tend to answer Jesus' question with a felt need rather than a real need. When Jesus says to blind Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? This man answers the same way all of us would have answered, with the number one felt need that he has. The number one felt need that he has is he can't see anything. And that disability has made it so he can go nowhere in society and has absolutely no options except to beg on the side of the road. But here's the question I want to ask you, brothers and sisters. If we know who Jesus is, and we know what Jesus is all about, and you know what he's about to do here on earth, right? So he encounters blind Bartimaeus. He says, what do you want me to do for you? What is the number one thing that blind Bartimaeus needs? Salvation. Jesus asks him the question to frame what he's doing, to show us who he is and what we really need. And you got it right in the notes right there, number two. Our greatest needs are salvation and sanctification. Salvation and sanctification. If we are here today, if you are here in the room and you have never given your life to Jesus Christ 
in that moment of decision to recognize that Jason was talking about in the video at the beginning, that I am giving my life to Jesus, he's my Lord and Savior, and I'm repenting of my sin. If you have never done that before, that is your greatest need. And I realize that there may be a lot of other things swirling around in life right now. There may be a, a ton of pain, there may be confusion, but the number one thing you need is to recognize Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today. And if you're here listening to me today, well, I've given my life to Jesus Christ. Now I'm living as a Christian. And believe it or not, your greatest need, the number one need you have today is to become more like Jesus today than you were yesterday. That's the greatest need you have. And I understand there's other ones. Those felt needs are really loud. And they get louder and louder and louder. But here's what Jesus often does. Jesus often uses, okay, we trust him, right? Jesus often uses our felt needs to point to the real needs in our lives. He often does this. He's doing it with blind Bartimaeus. He's showing him and the rest of us, by the way, who he is and what he's really here to do and what our greatest needs are. In fact, that we are often wrong about what our greatest needs are. Now, Lord, I need to be healed. And Jesus said, actually, there's other things that you need, that you're barely even aware of, that you should have in your prayer life. So I'm going to point you to those things by maybe elongating or making it feel like I'm not addressing some of those felt needs so that you become aware of who I really am. So you can actually meet me, who I really am. Because I think many of us in this room, we walk around in life and we've been Christians for a while and we are wondering whether or not Jesus is doing anything in our lives right now. See, is, is he doing much of anything in my life right now? I just feel like I'm going from sickness to sickness or from problem to problem, and I don't feel like I'm moving from strength to strength, and I'm wondering what in the world he's doing. I'm trying to raise a family. I'm trying to take care of my parents. I'm trying to do whatever the case may be, and this is what life is like. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, Jesus is working in your life. He just might be working on a project that you're not working on. A long time ago, 20 years ago, actually, 22 years ago now, I'm 40, i got to do different math, okay? 22 years ago, I was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. And at the time of my diagnosis, I was doing pretty bad. I was in college. I'm not that smart, but I'm not that dumb. And I was in college, and one of the red flags that people uh, used to tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, something might be wrong is that I failed four out of my five classes in one semester. Because they also knew that I'm not that smart, but I'm not that dumb. <laughs> so like something's wrong, and they were right. I wasn't doing well. And in the midst of treatment, one of the things that I did in a desperate attempt to just get anxiety out of my head and get something else into my head is I started reading this. I read the Bible constantly over and over out of sheer desperation to get something in my brain other than anxiety. I went up to a hotel in Mackinac City and I stayed there for days and all I did was open up the Word and read it. Cover to cover. You say, Pastor Steve, that's intense. Yes, I was desperate. But little did I know that what God was doing was something more like this. And he said, listen, right now, Steve, you are 20 years old, 19 years old. Here's what you don't know. When you are 40 years old, you're going to be the pastor of a church, and there's going to be a bunch of people there who need you to be eyeball deep in the Bible all the time, and you're not right now, and here is the best way to get you there. I didn't know that. I didn't know that the man that he would need me to be 20 years later for my children and my family would necessitate the path that I was taking at that time. I didn't know that, that even though I was praying desperately, Lord, take this away. And he said, no, I need to use that need that you feel right now to address a real need in your life to be humbly submitting yourself to my word and knowing it completely. I didn't know that that was the case, but he does this from time. He's doing it with blind Bartimaeus. So here's what we know. Number three. 
We cannot clearly see Jesus until we clearly see our need for Jesus. Do you know you need Jesus today? Here's the truth. We need him far more than we think we do. Even right now, right now in this room. I think, I think maybe we might have a pretty decent idea of how much we need Jesus. But the truth is, we don't have a clue. We don't have a clue. Look at the text again. Verse 38, the blind man calls out. He called out, Jesus, son of David. That is very interesting that he calls him to that. That's not how Jesus was identified to him. If you look just a verse before that, he's asking what the commotion's all about. And they say, verse 37, they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on you. He didn't say, Jesus of Nazareth, have mercy on me. He said, Jesus, son of David. Jesus, son of David, is a Messiah term. That's a Savior term. Right? And then, when Jesus asks him the question, verse 41, what do you want me to do for you? He says, I want to see. But that's not all he says. What does he call him? Lord, I want to see. So, in one fell swoop, we have this guy who identifies Jesus as Savior and Lord. He calls him both of those things. Now rewind to verse 31 with me. Jesus took the twelve aside, the disciples, and told them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. And verse 34, uh, the disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. So when Jesus encounters blind Bartimaeus on the road, and he's surrounded by an entourage of his followers, including the disciples, who can clearly see Jesus here? Is the blind man. Is the blind man. He gets the closest. I'm not sure he really gets quite there quite yet, but he gets the closest. He says, Son of David, and then calls him Lord. Nobody else who's walking around with Jesus has any idea who he really is. Right? As evidenced by the crowd at the front, they see blind Bartimaeus and they're like, hey, shut your mouth. If they knew who Jesus was, they would say, hey, Jesus, here's one of the people you like to stop and see. They got no idea. They got no idea. The one who can see him clearly, most clearly, is the one who can't see at all. And that's because he's the one in the greatest amount of need. He's in the greatest need. And he's been pushed to the point in life where he is completely desperate. He's out of resources if he ever had any. He has no place to go. He has no other options. And he sees Jesus. And therefore, he can clearly see him because he desperately needs him. You see, Jesus alludes to this all the time. He did so when he met the woman by the well. You remember the story? The woman by the well. And he said this to her. He said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. In other words, you got no idea who you're talking to. If you knew who I was, you wouldn't be messing around with asking me for water or any kind of felt needs. You would be asking me for forgiveness of your sins, because I can actually give that to you. And this guy, this blind part of man, he doesn't quite get there, but he gets the closest. He's closer than anyone else is to identifying who Jesus is. And it's because he's in the greatest amount of need. He says, Son of David, have what on me? Mercy. Mercy is all he has. He has no other options. The only choice that he has is to beg for mercy. He can't go buy anything. He can't go 
convince anyone to give anything to him. All he has is to cry out and to hope that someone has mercy on him. He is in desperate need. But because of that, he can clearly see, most clearly see who Jesus is. Look at number one there. All of us stand needy before Jesus. All of us. This is the truth you woke up today. In desperate need of Jesus Christ to help. Maybe you're not a Christian yet and you need his salvation. Or maybe, maybe you are a Christian and you need his work in your life. You woke up today with the total inability to do any of the day before you. It's Jesus who helps us. We are in desperate need. Yet we're often wrong about it. Yes, I want to be healed, but more than that, I need to be patient. I can't make myself patient. Only Jesus can do that. Yes, I want to have a better job, but more than that, I need to learn how to love people I don't like at my current job. I need that more than I need to switch jobs. Felt need, real need. Only Jesus can meet the real needs we have, right? Yes, I want to get that scholarship, but more than that, I need to learn to trust God no matter what happens. I need to learn to trust God no matter what happens, and that is not going to happen if Jesus just goes around meeting all of my felt needs all the time. That's not going to be the case. I want to clearly see who he is and what he's really here to do in my life. Yes, I want a clear medical diagnosis, but more than that, I need to learn how to choose joy when joy isn't the obvious choice or the natural result of my circumstances. That's what I need. I need to become more like him. I need him desperately to move in my life to make me more patient. Just look at the fruit of the Spirit. I need him to make me more joyful, more patient, more kind, more self-controlled. This is what I'm telling you. Do I need the pain in my leg to go away? Well, it'd be nice. And there are some days where I might say, man, that's the number one thing I need. And when I call in to submit a prayer request, that's the thing I'm submitting. But in truth, I've got other needs, and they're spiritual ones. And they're the ones that Jesus is working on. And they're the ones that I need the most. Look at number two. The things we need the most are things we do not deserve and cannot earn. I can't get them. I can't earn patience. I can't earn being more kind. I don't even deserve to be somebody who is becoming more like Jesus every day. I don't even deserve it. But what I do need is mercy. And mercy is all about receiving things that I don't deserve and I cannot earn. And this is why my Bartimaeus, though he's not quite there yet, can most clearly see who Jesus is. Look at what Jesus does. What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Now, I know that's one sentence, but here's really, something really cool. He's actually giving him two different things. Did you catch that? One sentence, but he's giving him two different things. You see, the NIV translation doesn't totally help us in this way. There are other translations that do it a little more literally. And what's happening in the Greek there is this, and you might catch it when I quote the Greek a little more accurately. This is Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. That's what it says. So what are the two things that he has received? He received his sight, and he received salvation. And you know that's the case because here's what the text says. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus. Praising God. And when all the people saw it, they also praised God. Last thing we can notice. Jesus is so good that he gives us what we really need, and some of what we really want. See that? This is what I wanted you to see today. I just wanted you to see how great your Savior is. I wanted you to see how good He is. 
I want you to see the fact that he sees you wherever you are in your life right now. And he understands your situation perfectly. And he knows exactly what you need, even if you don't know exactly what you need at the moment. So I'm going to ask you again the same question. Imagine that Jesus walks right up to you and he says, what do you want me to do for you? Now, how are we answering this question? Here's my challenge to you. This week, in prayer, ask God one question. I believe wholeheartedly, because I've also been praying that this would be the case, I believe that he will answer this question for you. Because I believe that he is very interested in me knowing the answer. And here's the question that I want you to ask God in prayer this week. God, what is my greatest need? What's my greatest need? It could be that your greatest need right now is to be more patient with your kids. That could be number one on the Holy Spirit's agenda in your life. It could be that you need to trust God more with your health. It could be that. It says, listen, right now, every time something goes wrong, you're, uh, you're on WebMD before you even get close to praying. Right? Maybe like that? That's me, man. I'm like, oh, I got a headache, and it's, it's, it feels like it's on one side of my head. Of course, I have a tumor, and I'm dying tomorrow. That's By the way, a headache is a symptom for everything on WebMD. Got a little experience in this. But I'm just telling you, prayer is the first step. Maybe that's what I need to learn. I need to learn that I need to trust God more. And the issues having to do with my health, I don't know what the need might be. For you, it might be, you know what? You need to be more joyful when your circumstances are not joy-inducing circumstances. These are the things that Jesus is working on in our lives to make us more like him. It's more like him. Because here's the thing about meeting Jesus face to face, is that we walk away looking more like him than we did looking, about looking like us. And this is what he wants to do in our lives. So here's my, here's my challenge. Pray one thing. God, what's my greatest need right now? I believe he'll show it to you. And when he does, pray for that. Pray for the need too. But pray for that. And watch the work that he will do in your life.